Okay, today we cover layers. <coughs> Lesson eight has you put the various parts of a clock together. And I'm not going to do the exercise step by step, but I will show you. And you've already used layers, but I will show you how fundamentally layers work. So let me close some of my palettes. And let me see if I have layers open. One of the things that I would make sure that you have open under window is the layers panel. So with the mask that we've started, in order to work with that, I said if you bring in a photograph, sometimes it's best at the bottom. You use that <coughs> as a template layer. So that's a bottom layer, and then we created a drawing layer on top of that. You can have as many layers as you need. I think it's almost infinite number of layers. It can get very confusing, though, if you're not careful. So let me go ahead and create a new file just so we can start from scratch. And you can see when you start with a new file, it automatically gives you one layer called layer one. So let me go ahead and click and drag this off so you can see a little better what I'm doing here. <coughs> And let's look at the layer panel. To rename a layer, you double click on it. Instead of layer one, maybe I want this to be, you know, drawing layer. So this is my drawing layer, and it's renamed. To turn the visibility on and off for a layer, you have the little eye icon, which is similar to what you'd have in layers in um, um, Photoshop. You can also lock a layer if you wish to protect it by toggling on and off and clicking and you see the little lock symbol. In addition to that, down at the bottom, now a lot of these, because I don't have any shapes at the moment, are, are blocked off. But this one allows you to create a clipping mask. Okay, that will either make or release it. It has a dual function. This one creates a new sub-layer, so you can have layers within layers, sort of, it just, it's a way of organizing them, uh, is what it's doing. And then this is a way of creating a brand new layer. So if I click on here, we have layer two. And if I want to delete a layer, I can click and I can drag it in the trash. I can also move the order of layers. By default, the one at the bottom is like the bottom of a stack of paper. And every layer on top of it is on top of the, of the next and the next and the next. It's easier, I think, if you, th if th you think of them as transparent sheets of plastic and you put elements on those sheets of plastic and when you layer them on top of one another and you look at it, it looks like a single sheet. That's really what we're doing. The only purpose of layers, well, not the only, but the, the probably the single most important purpose of layers is to simply separate or segregate parts of your illustration. <coughs> so that they don't, uh, that you may have already discovered that when parts overlap, it's difficult to select them, it's difficult to keep them organized, and that's a way of organizing your project. Okay, you'll also notice these little buttons to the right here, and as soon as I select, and these will be more for another exercise, these are, have to do with appearance, but also when you select an object, there will be a little checkbox to the right of that. But appearances are a part of lesson 12. So let me go ahead and I'm going to get rid of layer 2. So we just start with our basic drawing layer. And I'll start by creating a shape here, just a simple rectangle. And I'll fill it with green. So I have it, think of it like a, what we're going to do is think of these like a deck of cards. So I lay one card down. And if I select the, ob <coughs> select the card, hold down the Option key, and click and drag in Release, when I twirl down, you'll notice that I have two paths. With this one selected, now I'll make this one red. Notice that the new one, the one that I copied, is automatically layered on top of the previous one. So every time you create a new object, or you copy and paste, or in this case, I, I copy just by using key commands, it automatically makes, it places that on top of all the rest within that layer. 
Does that make sense? The other thing that you should notice with this selected, notice that it's outlined in blue. By default, each layer is assigned a color. And you can change the, the order of the color. I see no reason why you should. But there may be a particular instance where the color, the dominant color on that layer is blue and it's hard to see the outline, so maybe you want to change it to red or something like that. We'll show you how you can change that. But each layer is assigned a color. And you'll notice when we look over to the right that this particular shape that's selected now is highlighted. You see this little blue checkbox over here, blue box. That indicates that that layer is selected. When, layer, when objects or that object is selected, when objects overlap and it's difficult to select one without selecting the other, what we can do is we can click here and now notice that the back one is selected. So not only can you simply click on the objects and select them, you can select them from over here by clicking to the right. This little button tells you <coughs> the properties or the appearance, I should say, of this. So if I were to select one of these and I click the appearance panel, it gives me some important information about this. It tells me that it has a one-point stroke and it has an orange fill. And when we be, uh, begin to apply effects, they will be um, visible here as well. If you assign, uh, you may not be aware of it. I don't know if I've shown this video yet. <coughs> Did I show, show it where you can assign multiple strokes, multiple appearances to a single stroke? I haven't shown that. I guess I'm thinking back to the summer class that I taught. <coughs> but I could have one, two, three, four, five strokes assigned to the same path. And it will show up here. That's for another day. Just trust me, you can do that. But all of them would be available, would be accessible in the appearance panel. And when you look at the appearance, it would be visible here. <coughs> when I've applied an effect to this particular object, so maybe I added, I'll add a drop shadow to it. Okay, drop shadow under effect. Filters, it doesn't do this. See how I've added the drop shadow to the orange? And notice that when I look over here, notice that it's, it, this is now darkened. So it tells me that effect has been applied to this particular object. You can apply appearances to entire layers or to individual objects. Also notice in the appearance panel that that drop shadow under effect is here now as well. So if I want to change the effect after I've applied it or delete it, I simply double click on it. It brings the drop shadow panel back up and allows me to make changes to it. As I said, if I'm going to get rid of it, <coughs> excuse me, drop it in the trash can and it's gone. So that's for another day, though. But again, that's what this little circle stands for. <coughs> so that's our layers panel. <coughs> Let me go ahead and make a few more of these so I have my stack of cards. I'll select this one. We'll make it blue. I'm going to select this one. And we'll make it yellow. We'll select this one. And we'll make it purple. Okay. As I said, every time we made a copy, it's stacked on top of the last one. <coughs> one of the ways we've reordered these, for example, if I decided that I want to put the purple card on the bottom of my deck, or to put it behind the yellow one, <coughs> is that I can select it. I can go to Object Arrange. And I can, if I want to put it to the back of the deck, I can say Send a Back. And now it sends it all the way to the back. And you'll also notice in the Layers panel, it's represented here as well. You can see that it has taken it and put it all the way to the back of the deck. <coughs> Likewise, I can go to Object, Arrange, and I can say Bring to Front. And it brings it to the front. And notice over here in the Layers panel, it brings it to the front of that layer, just of that layer. Now, if I select Object, Arrange, and I say br Send Backward, all it does is it takes it one step back. Now it's behind the yellow one. 
if I, s if I do that again, if I select object, arrange, send backward, it takes it one step again. Now it's behind the blue. <coughs> and again, you see that represented here. Another way of moving these up and down in their order, their stacking order, is just simply have the layers panel. And if I want this to be back on top of the deck, just click and drag and move it. And it's back on top of the, of the deck. That's the easiest way to do that. So it's easy to select it. And like we named the layer, we can also name our paths. So if you're, again, you're developing or creating a really complex illustration and it's important, you have lots of little tiny little shapes and you want to be able to discern one from the other and it's hard to tell. You know, you've got, it's like a big jigsaw puzzle. Might be helpful to start naming them. That if I name that, <coughs> I can name it purple path. You know, so it's purple path, just purple. Purple card. And notice that you can lock, again, individual um, paths. You can lock an entire layer. And when you do, then you get that little symbol. It's a pencil with a strike through, which means that you can't draw on it. Just simply unlock it, and you're ready to go. OK, so. <coughs> The other thing that it's important to note is that watch what happens when I select the entire group and I, I want to turn these into a group or if I select a few of these and I turn them into a group. Watch what happens. It's more important to watch what, what happens in the layers panel. With all of them selected, if I go object and I select group or command G, notice what happens. Within that layer, you see and it's named group, and you can rename it by double-clicking on it. When I twirl down, it shows all of the elements in that group. And again, they all have, everything has a stacking order. So if I were to create another object here, which would definitely be on top of the group, so let's go ahead and start with some circles now, ellipses. Notice that the ellipse is on top of the group, but I can place that and drag it and put it below the group. <coughs> and I can move it so it's beneath it. It's on the same layer, but this will always be beneath the entire group. I can put it inside the group if I want and then stack it within that, but that group now is a unit. So what if I decide, okay, I have my <coughs> rectangular cards and I want some disks and I want to put them on their own layer. So let's go ahead and create a brand new layer. And we'll name this one, I'm going to name this one Circles. And I'll name, rename this one Rectangles. Okay, now this one happens to be on my rectangle layer. But again, with it selected, and again I can select it by selecting the object, or I can select it here in the layer. And what I can do is I can click and I can drag this now up to this little square, drag it up to the circle layer. Looks like nothing has changed, but when I twirl down, you'll see that that path now is in the circle layer. So I can move them up and down between layers. And now when I move this, notice it's on top of that entire stack because this layer is now on top of that layer. If I were to move this whole layer down below, now it's below. The circle layer is below the rectangle layer. Also notice the color assigned to the next layer. It's now red. Now when it's selected, the objects are selected, you see that they're outlined not in blue, but they're outlined in red. So again, it's just a, it's a visual way of you keeping track of the objects and what order they're on. So maybe when you're done with one layer, you can lock it temporarily and move on a layer on top of it, so on and so forth. And if you need to move them up and down, you can. <coughs> so I'll move the circles back on top. I'm going to make copies of these again. And we'll twirl down. And again, the same thing applies. All of these on this layer, every time I create a new one, it's stacked on top of the last. One more for good measure. Select this one. Green. Just start assigning different colors to these so you can see. Um, and orange. Okay. So all of these are layered on top. 
So far to select them all and move them up, they're all on top of that one. If I do, if I move the whole layer and move it down like so, they're all beneath it now. Um, something else we can do that's a part of this next exercise that is pretty important. And we've used it before, but they're called clipping masks. And it's really pretty nice. What they, what they have done is that they've made, and we can actually take a couple of these and do this. I'm going to take, and I'm going to stack these so that they're closer together. And since they are a group, I, need, I can select them individually down here within the group. So I don't need the group selection tool, actually. I can select them from here, and I can begin to move them so that they're closer together. Does everybody remember that if you don't do this, and I wanted to select these, notice that it selects the whole group. And if I don't use this from layers, I would have to come over here. Now we'd have to use the group selection tool in order to select individual elements. Okay. So let's say I want these rectangles, <coughs> and I probably should put this on, in fact I do have to put this on the same layer, but watch what happens since these are on different layers. Watch what happens when I select these now. And I want this circle to be a clipping mask and what that means is that the rectangles will only be visible inside the circle. But now notice that the circles are above, the rectangles are below, and watch what happens when I click this. Okay? It doesn't work. So let me undo this. I need to take my circles and I need to bring this one down on top of this group like so. The circle is inside the group. I can put it on top of the group if I want. Let me move it just on top right here. There we go. So now they're on the same layer. Now I will select them all. The clipping mask has to be on the top, <coughs> and it tells me I can't do it. So what did I do wrong? Let's go ahead and lock the circles, so that's done. Let's close this. Let's select all of these. What did I do wrong? Maybe it needs to be on top of the group? Probably. Let me go, I wasn't, didn't think about that. Well, let's try clipping mask make. It works. But why this didn't work here is that maybe it had to be within that group. So I'm going to undo it and try it again. And notice that the properties of the circle go away. And when I turn off preview, <coughs> all of those rectangles are still there. So now when I twirl down, you see the clipping mask, and it is contained on top of that group. And I move the group, and I select part of the group, and I can move that around like so. So if I decide to move one of these, come on. Having troubles here. Let me hit Command Command Y. So that's there we go. Okay. See how you can move them within that. If you wish to remove the clipping mask, so that it brings out all the shapes again, select the object, not with the individual select the whole thing from here, or select the group <coughs> from here, and go Object, Clipping Mask, Release. Now, it looks like the circle went away, because, but it's still there. <coughs> because once you turn it into a clipping mask, it removes the, the properties. Whatever you defined as the stroke, and whatever you defined as the fill. So it, now it has no stroke, it has no fill, but it's still there. So when I hit Command Y to turn off preview, notice that this is still there. 
and it looks like it's still locked in there. There we go. So it's still there. And let's go ahead and assign a fill to it, red and white. Hit Command Y, turn it back. So it didn't disappear. I mean, it, it did disappear, but it wasn't deleted. It was still there. So be careful, because sometimes you, like with type, <coughs> if you're not careful, you'll find these little artifacts, these things that are left over that you thought were gone, that are behind something else, or just really have no properties, but they're still there. They're part of your file that you may have to clean up from time to time. Now, remember I said, let me get rid of this from here, or let me just move it back up to the circle layer. Oh, come on. Oh, because it's locked. There we go. That's why you lock things. So it puts it up there. So we have our rectangles and our circles. Um, forgot what I was said. Oh, I remember. I said, notice that layers also have um, appearance properties, too. And this is pretty cool because what if, and I'm jumping way ahead because this will be like an exercise 12, but it's something that you may want to incorporate now. What if you wanted a drop shadow applied to every object on that layer and didn't want to have to remember to go and apply an, or, uh, apply, um, an effect to each one of those elements? Well then, let's say for example on the circle layer, if I click this little button and activate it on the circle layer, and I go to Effect and apply Stylize Drop Shadow, and I click, notice that drop shadows have been applied to all of the elements now. The only problem is with effects, when it has to redraw them, it takes some time. But notice all of the circles now have a drop shadow. Watch what happens if I take one of the rectangles and I move it to the circle layer. Now that it's on that layer and it's going to redraw, it has a drop shadow. So that can be effective. It can also really screw you up too. If you wonder why, you know, why is it every time I'm, I'm, I put something on this layer, it has this effect that I didn't want. Um, well, then what you have to do is you have to go to Window and bring Appearance back up. And when it's visible, and we select the layer. <coughs> Whoops, sorry, the wrong layer. Rectangle. Oh, that was a circle. I did want that. And you'll see under, by clicking that appearance panel for the layer, you see drop shadow is selected. So if I want to remove it from all of them, all I have to do is click on it and put it in the trash, and now they're all gone. And if you want drop shadows to be added to only individual elements, then you do, you select just those elements and you apply it. But that's the, one of the useful features of having this on layers itself. Now, if you want to change the color of a layer, notice that this one I said is red, and you don't like red, you want another color. Double click on the layer, and when it brings up layer options, then you can rename it. Notice that we have a whole bunch of default colors, and it goes in, these, in this order. You start with the light blue, then layer two would be red, layer three would be green, layer four would be blue, and so on and so forth. But you can make this you know, any color you want. You can also, from layer options, turn it into a template layer, as we've done with the mask assignment. And when you turn it into a template layer, it automatically locks it, it automatically turns off print, and it automatically shows it, it and it automatically previews it, and it automatically dims the image as soon as you click OK. And the reason it dims the image is because templates, it's assuming, is that what you're doing with that layer is that you're using it as a guide and you're drawing on top of it. So typically you want to lock it, you know, it, think, I think in literal terms, literal visual terms. And this goes back to the days when you would use, tr you know, tracing paper. And you'd have a tablet of tracing paper and you'd take the, the top sheet and lift it up. You put your photograph or your drawing underneath and you tape it to the sheet underneath and you put the sheet back on top of it. Well, locking it is like 
putting that piece of tape on there so it doesn't move around. Um, it also, put, by putting it on a separate layer, now that you're separating the drawing from that template so you don't accidentally draw on the template layer, which you can do. But then you'll discover very quickly that when you're trying to select part of your drawing, you accidentally select some of the template by mistake because of its size and that they overlap one another and it gets messy. So it's a way of isolating all of it. <coughs> so if I unlock, and also notice how the icon changes when you turn that into a template layer. You get this little graphic representation of a triangle, circle, and a square. And that <coughs> all it does is it tells you that that's what it is. And by default, it should be locked. It's kind of odd, though. It's not grayed out, though, is it? Um, it says 50%. Well, I don't have an image. That's why. Okay. There are objects, not an image, not a, a Photoshop or bitmap image. So that really is layers in a nutshell. And when you come back to this particular exercise, you'll see that, for example, all the numbers have drop shadows. That's pretty much what we're doing here. You'll notice the stripes fit inside a circle. That's the clipping mask. That that's what we did here. <coughs> they have two principal layers. They have the face layer, the frame layer to isolate, and then the elements within each. Why are they grouped that way? because they felt it was the best way to organize it and to keep those, those parts separate. Sometimes it makes sense. You know, maybe you've taken the time, you're doing a portrait, and there's, you know, you break the elements of the, of the, of the face down into its individual parts, and you have the eye. Well, within the eye, you might have the pupil, you'll have the iris, the sclera, you'll have all the various parts that you want to function as a group, and maybe you, it needs to be on a separate layer as well. So you turn them into a group so that they function as a single unit. You want them on top, or you want them separate from everything else, so maybe they'll be on a separate layer too. So that they've thought here, and it makes good sense, that the face, since that, that's at the top here, is one element. So when if I move that, see, the entire face moves. That makes sense that that's <coughs> a single unit. And likewise, the frame, all of the elements, all of the shapes below that make up that various component are separated on layers. <coughs> um, it's worthwhile sometimes opening and seeing what other people, how they organize their work. Because <coughs> if, if you're working with a co very complex illustration, <coughs> over time, keeping it all, all on one layer can get overwhelming to keep track of everything. When this extends and gets longer and longer and longer, and you have hundreds and hundreds of paths and you don't know what, which is which, because you haven't been naming them or anything, and you don't know where it's located in there and it might be hidden, <coughs> um, it is helpful to start to think in terms of grouping things and then layering them and locking them and unlocking them and it, organizing them, mm -hmm. basically organizing the various parts of your illustration. So I'm going to open just at random one of our sample files. It's inside the applications folder. Maybe we can open a couple of them. Cool extras, sample files. Excuse me, sample art. <coughs> Let's open the um, crystal. Let's see what this one looks like. Uh, just open it. That's what I wanted. There we go. Notice how he's broken it down into one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine layers. Within each layer, for example, he has a group of credits. Here's all the individual elements within that. And then there's a group within group compound curve. If all of these elements were on one layer, it would be overwhelming. Even without that, notice that there's, you know, lots of parts to this. Select it again. Okay, so that was a single element. Those are the marbles. Reflections or another element. 
class is another element. That's class two. And then we have class one, which is he, he kept breaking it down, or she. Usually he does these. <coughs> Shadow. <coughs> Why it's organized this way, it made sense to the person who built it. Sometimes, as I say, they make it makes perfect sense. It's pretty logical. Other times, it's who knows why the person broke it down the way they did. It just made sense to them while they were building it, and how they thought it would make sense to organize it, and keep the elements separate. <coughs> when you're done, you can leave them as separate layers, or you can put everything on one layer. I think it's best to leave them in layers the way that you've built it. There's no reason even if it's going to print, because what you can do is you can lock all of these. <coughs> also, if it's going to print, you can convert this to a bitmap, turn it into a Photoshop file, and that would work too. OK? Makes sense with layers? <coughs> No, layers has been around forever. Because by nature, by nature, the way vector graphics works is because everything is a separate object, right? And think in terms of physics. <coughs> you can't have two things occupy the same place in space. And the same is true with these objects. So what it does is it looks like they're occupying the same space, but they're actually layered on top of one another. And if you're working in a 3D modeling program, it's the same thing. They can't occupy the same space. If you're working in a desktop publishing program, that's typically ve vector graphics too, and they are all layered on top of one another. It's not true in Photoshop. Bo Photoshop is raster or bitmap. <coughs> when we look at a Photoshop file, and I'm sure you've noticed this when you bring your image in, you see those individual pixels. And depending on the bit, map, bit depth of, of the file you're working on will determine how many colors you can have for each one of those pixels. But if you look at it, I mean, if I zoom in on this one, let me go back to here. If I zoom in on this, I can zoom way, way in. And you don't see those individual pixels, do you? I mean, uh, this is, what, a couple thousand percent or something? I mean, it's, I've zoomed in really, really deep. I switch back to um, Photoshop and I open a file. Let's find something here. Even a high res photo. Um, I'm going to go back to Macintosh applications. Uh, did I already pass it? Where's fo there's Photoshop. Um, samples. which should be a good one. A flower, maybe. Oh, let's just look at, yeah, let's look at the flower, why not? So, on the screen at 100%, this looks good. But watch what happens when I zoom in here now. Now you start to see all the individual pixels that make up that image. Individual little squares. So that when you paint, and you see the big brush here, and I want to paint with white, let me go ahead and pick a, let me, I'm going to pick a single pixel brush. Boom. So now what I do, when I click here, Should probably turn off anti-aliasing, but it's actually 100%, 100%. Yeah, I'm painting and affecting one pixel at a time. You can't do that in Illustrator. You just have to see things in terms of of shapes as objects. That's why it's if you've ever taken a beginning drawing class, and sometimes what they'll have you do, or if even a painting class, because painting is a little different than drawing. That you should think in terms of shapes when you paint, not 
linear outlines in the way that you do with drawing. And so if you start by looking at the subject, if it's a life painting class, and take a, a sheet of paper and you, you know, make a, cut out a silhouette of a shape of the arm that you see, of the face, of whatever, a jacket, and that sort of thing. That's what the way that this works. That it's like taking pieces of paper, construction paper, and cutting out the shapes and then stacking them on top of one another. <coughs> Having said that, there is, and we can watch it today, we can watch it next week. Next week might be a good time to look at the Pathfinder tool. Because it still works with layers, <coughs> but it allows us to do some pretty complex things in short, very short order. Did I already show it to you? I don't think I did. No? It's barely talked about in the textbook. And there's a great demonstration on lynda.com that's fairly complicated. <coughs> but it shows you how you can just work with basic shapes and use the Pathfinder tool to make from those basic shapes very complex shapes. <coughs> Let me do that quickly, just one example. Um, let me go back to Illustrator. I'm going to close that file. Don't save. Um, I don't need that. I don't need Photoshop. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. Sure, do you have a pen? Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah, sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> okay, Pathfinder tool. And it does a variety of things. I'm sure I, I thought I had shown this to you. Um, let me go back to I'll close these. Just select everything and delete it from that layer. Unlock this layer. Throw this layer away. <coughs> okay. So let's go to Window, bring up the Pathfinder tool. And this is what it looks like. You'll notice that we have shape modes where they combine. We subtract the front from the back. We it, we're in, shapes intersect. We can create new shapes. And we can also exclude overlapping shapes. The ones down here, most of these are useless, but this one divide is really, really important, really, really cool, really cool. So for example, <coughs> let's start by making a, uh, a rectangle, like so. And on top of that, <coughs> let's make a star shape. I'll make it a little bit different color. Whoops, should have deselected. There we go. So let's select a different color. And let's put the star shape on top of it. <coughs> what if I wanted to create a shape that was really a combination of these two, that when they were combined, you wouldn't see the little star piece in here? So if I selected this shape and this one, and I selected combine, I have this intermediate shape that it's really what, what it is when you go to object down here. It's, oh, I gotta remember what the heck it's called. Uh, uh, uh. It's a compound path is what it is. And if I wanna make this permanent, because right now I can release this compound path and they, they remain independent objects. But when I'm done, if I want to expand this, now notice that intermediate shape is gone, and I've created a fairly complex shape like that. What if I want to take another shape? Let's take a circle, for example. I'm making a different color just to see the difference, and I put this on top. And I want to cut this circle out of this. We select both again. Select this one, and notice it removes it. 
So in very short order, by just by stacking shapes and using these, we can create a whole bunch of really complex. To use the pen tool and to create this on your own would take much longer, wouldn't it? And it wouldn't be as precise. If I expand this, look what I have. <coughs> now this is the one, the outline paths, that I think is really cool. So for example, sometimes you'll do the simplest thing that normally would take, you would think it would take forever. Um, that it doesn't, let me click in here for a minute. And I'm going to turn this into a triangle, a nice big triangle. Okay, let's say I wanted to create one of these little food chain kind of things, these little pyramids, that I could actually come in here and I could make stripes in here that this could fill with a color, then after that you could fill with a color, and so on and so forth. Well, what I can do with the pen tool or just individual strokes is I can click and drag across like so. And then let's go ahead and hold down the Option key and we'll make some copies of this. Like so. Let's go ahead and make one more for good measure. And it overlaps, doesn't it? But I want each of these to be later to become separate colors. So if I select all of them now, let's deselect this, and now I select this and I say divide, notice what happens. Now when I can select each of these, it treats it as a group, but now if I come back and I use the group selection tool, and I select this one, I can fill it with a color. I can take that one and I can fill it with a color, and I can take this one and I can fill it with a color. They're all separate, sh they're all separate shapes now. Now, isn't that a lot easier than trying to build the others? They're all, yeah, they're all separate now. So if I use, if I select it, I can ungroup, <coughs> shift command G, and now I can select each of these, and each of these are now independent shapes. Pretty cool, huh? So when I show you the illustration, we'll, we'll watch the lynda.com next week. It's really, really pretty nifty. It gets pretty complicated and it's convoluted the way he does it. But you can start with very, he starts with, again with very simple shapes and creates really complex ones by using this. And he, he rarely uses, I don't think he uses the pen tool at all, at all. And I think it's a more efficient way to work. And why they don't stress this and why they haven't stressed this for a long time, I don't know. So, I don't know how far along you are with your mask assignment, but this could be pretty um, useful. There's another thing that I didn't do here, though. What if you wanted to take, <coughs> let's try a little triangle and put it in here, make it a different color just so we can see it. What if you wanted to poke a hole in the shape? You either put the shape if <coughs> on top of it. So for example, what if I wanted to see white behind this? I would have to turn this into a white shape and then turn <coughs> the stroke off and then turn this into a group. Does that make sense? So it looks like it's transparent, but it really isn't because if I were to take one of these shapes and put it behind here and go object, arrange, send it back, I can't see through it, can I? So it's not truly transparent, but watch when I select these two shapes and I select subtract, and I select expand. Why won't it let me expand? I guess it automatically did. Okay. Now you can see through it. Little window. So if you're trying to poke holes for the eyes in your mask and stuff, that's how you do it. That's the easiest way to do it. So that's the Pathfinder tool. And again, even when with all of these, you still see all the individual paths layered on top of one another. So that's it for layers. Um, different people who work in Illustrator have different philosophies. I try to, to 
to work with the minimum number of layers, but I'm not afraid to create additional layers when needed if, so that, again, to keep my illustration organized. Does that make sense? Okay. And how you organize them, will, it will make sense to you when you're building your illustration. You'll see things in terms of groups. And when you see them in terms of groups, then you'll probably want to turn them into a group. If they can stay on the same layer, great. If it's getting confusing, then maybe put them on a separate layer. Okay, that's it. Um, next week, I probably will not lecture, but I will show some of those lynda.com videos. Yeah, we're working on that this week. <coughs> so then, 